your blindfolds in place? Very well then. Ask yourselves, what is wrong with this sentence? Uh, the cosmic realm, the, some sort of celestial event. <laughs> So today I want to tell you three reasons why I'm a mythicist and think that Jesus probably didn't exist. First, I want to introduce you to Philo of Alexandria. He is a first century Jew that was writing before Jesus supposedly pimp walked around Judea. He is important to the mythicist position because he is a prime example of a Jew that believed in a pre-existent celestial being named Jesus named Jesus named Jesus I'm actually not trying to pick on John here I think John's a good dude I think you should subscribe to his channel Godless Engineer but I think he's mistaken on Carrier I think he's being misled because he wants Carrier to be right recently John did a video with Carrier about how wrong Dr. Litwa is on the ascension of Isaiah. And he called Dr. Litwa a liar and incompetent, which is a pretty hefty charge if you're gonna call someone that and not show anybody why. And in this video, Carrier just says, simply says he's wrong, says all the scholars agree with me, and I can't believe he didn't look at the scholarship. But it turns out when you actually do look into the scholarship, Litwa was the one that was reading what the scholarship says. Carrier is just using wild speculation. And I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to show you why Carrier is the one who just uses wild speculation, ignores the context, ignores the scholarship, and everybody who disagrees with him is secretly an apologist. They're believers. They're not to be trusted. And there's a giant cabal of apologists that are running academia. And they're all out to get Carrier. And Carrier, everyone knows Carrier's book is true. They don't want you to read it. That's why they don't actually engage with the material. They don't look at the scholarship. You hear this a lot of times from all these people. But that's not just it's not the case. People do engage with the material. He gets nasty with them. People who he was friends with, he, you know, calls incompetent. He falsely quotes Dr. Ehrman, saying that Ehrman was saying he was incompetent. But that's not the case. Airman doesn't say anything like that. And if you ask him for a source, he'll just direct you to one of his blogs about Airman, where he paraphrases what Airman says. And it's just not there. So there's a lot of misleading stuff. It reminds me of Ralph Ellis. If you go to a Ralph Ellis Facebook post, he's whining about scholars, how they don't listen to him and how they don't give him credit. And everyone's copying Ralph and... They're all against Ralph, the academia, his big cabal against Ralph. And and they both use the same sort of methodology in, in the sense that he doesn't give you the full picture. He takes things out of context. He has wild speculation based off speculation. That's oftentimes based off speculation. And for one of those dominoes to fall, the whole thing falls. Um, the martyrdom and ascension of Isaiah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. But this is a fairly easy, accessible text, and uh, I'll just kind of help not your, easy or accessible, your viewers but... know the resources. So <laughs> Now, this is what Carrier does throughout this entire two-hour video, is he just laughs and says, that is not true. <laughs> and then John just, like, picks up on his, like, signals and just laughs along as if they're checking something. And he literally just said, this is very accessible work. Carrier said, that's not true. I'm holding it in my hand right now. James Charlesworth, pseudopigrapha. This is standardized text. This is what you would get in college. This is, it has all the manuscript evidence for the ascension of Isaiah in here. Everything Lit was saying is based on the scholarship and it's based on what's in here. Carrier is just making shit up and just speculating what sounds better for mythicism. And I just think it's funny how they're charging him with being a liar and not knowing the scholarship. And he's blatantly lying right in your face. Um, James Charlesworth, whom I know you've had on the show, yep. has this two volume set on the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. And that's easily accessible. I uh, Sorry to interrupt, but isn't <laughs> Charlesworth the guy that you had like that 
really ir- irrational conversation with on history value one time. Oh, this is a different person. Um, oh, different. Okay. Wait, go back. Let me make sure. Uh, I, I, we could be talking about a different book. Hold on. That is Charles. No, it is the guy. Yeah, that is the crazy guy who who thinks uh, Laz- Lazarus can't have written the Gospel of John because resurrected people can't run fast. That's yes. Not, that's <laughs> yeah. All, all right. Um, now, when I saw this right here, my mind was literally blown that they would call someone like Charlesworth a crank. Awarded Outstanding Educator of America in 1975, Frank Moore Cross Award, Duke Graduate School PhD, Director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Project at Princeton Theological Seminary. This is this is what I mean by fringe and mainstream established like high level scholarship, like people like Charlesworth, Litwa, people like Tony Burke, people like James, uh, John Kloppenborg, Celine Lilly. These people are translating texts and putting together texts that are like state that are becoming standardized for college level courses. Carriers writing fringe books that are like Ralph Ellis level conspiracy level shit. And for him to call this person crazy, Charlesworth doesn't agree with Carrier. So he's 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 crazy. He's fringe. He's a believer. He can't be trusted. And it reminds me of when I used to go to church and the pastor would say the same thing about academia that Carrier's saying. So you have academia in the middle. On this side, on this far edge, you have these fundamentalist Christians who say academia are a bunch of liberal atheists. They can't be trusted. Bart Ehrman, oh my God, he, I, Bart Ehrman's the worst. He's by the, he's from the devil. You know, Litwa's from the devil. We should fire Litwa. And then on the other side, on the spectrum, you have mythicists who say, oh, the academia, they're a bunch of fundamentalist Christians. Huh, they believe Jesus existed. How, oh my God, they're a bunch of apologists. And so they, they poison the well. It doesn't matter who the person is, how established they are. They could be from Princeton. They could be from Yale. They could be from Harvard. They can be the, Top of the line, greatest of all time, translating manuscripts every single day from Greek, from Coptic, from Syriac, and doing the most work humanly possible. And they're incompetent and they're a liar because they don't believe Carrier. So uh, the the next the next little section that I have, uh, it's going to repeat a little bit because it's going to be the whole, you know, uh, myths just don't like this portion or whatever, just don't like it. John skips ahead. And I, and I go, wait, wait, wait a minute. What is he skipping? And the part that he skipped is literally the part that Litwa says they mythicists just want to delete. Like, you can't make this shit up. Now, the reason why some want to portray uh, the ascension of Isaiah as a highly uh, doctored and inconsistent text full of interp- interpolations and errors is because there's some parts of the ascension of Isaiah that they don't like. It's so ironic. And the last thing I want to say about the Ascension of Isaiah things, I got bigger fish to fry with Carrier than this. Carrier claims in this clip right here. We can't use it very strongly as evidence. And so in on the history of Jesus, I use it very weakly. It has almost no effect on the probability. He says the Ascension of Isaiah is not a big deal to him. Page 36 to 48, page 141, page 180, page 182 to 83, page 187, page 192, Page 194, page 214, page 276, page 319, page 321 to 23, page 330, page 351, page 357. You guys get the picture, right? 40 pages in his book mentions the ascension of Isaiah. So if this is not central to mythicism, I don't know what is. And why else would you do a two-hour video about some guy's opinion on the ascension of Isaiah if it wasn't a big deal? This is like blasphemy to them. This is... Somebody, somebody blasphemed their, their, their doctrine, and now they have to, they have to fix it. That's what, this is what this is. I want to introduce you to Philo of Alexandria. He is a prime example of a Jew that believed in a pre-existent celestial being named Jesus. Named Jesus. Named Jesus. Philo of Alexandria, he wrote in the 20s to 40s AD, so roughly shortly before Paul, shortly before Christianity, or coterminous with it. Uh, He was a Jewish theologian, uh, in fact, one of the most respected of his era. 
he attests in his writings that, and I cite all of the passages in uh, my book on the historicity of Jesus, he attests that in fact, there was a pre-Christian Jewish belief in a celestial being actually named Jesus. Uh, he, he actually finds the, the character named Jesus in Zechariah 6, and he says that this, uh, this being uh, actually is a celestial being, not a man in history, un unlike the verse as it was ri originally intended. So he tells us this, that there was a pre-Christian Jewish belief in a celestial being named Jesus. In a celestial being named Jesus. Celestial being named Jesus. Who was, and he says, this is, these are all the attributes of this, this pre-Christian Jesus in outer space. He was the firstborn son of God. Who was the firstborn son of God. He was the celestial image of God. The celestial image of God. He was God's agent of creation. God's agent of creation. And he was God's celestial high priest. And God's celestial high priest. Now the curious thing is in our earliest writings for Christians, this is exactly the Jesus they're talking about. All of these attributes are assigned to their Jesus. Now Carrier has listed in his sources Philo, Confusion of Tongues, 62 to 63. And here's what the text actually says. I have also heard of one of the companions of Moses having uttered such a speech as this. Behold a man whose name is the East. A very novel appellation indeed. If you consider it is spoken of a man who is compounded of body and soul. But if you look upon it as applied to that incorporeal being who in no respect differs from the divine image, you will then agree that the name of the East has been given to him with great felicity. For the father of the universe has caused him to spring up as the eldest son, whom in another passage he calls the firstborn, who is thus born imitating the ways of his father. He has formed such and such species, looking to his archetypal patterns. Now, there was no Jesus in that passage. So what is he talking about? Well, I know what he's talking about. Before we even get to that, he has two other sources listed. Let's see if there's any Jesus in there. 146 to 47 says, And even if there be not as yet one who is worthy to be called a son of God, Nevertheless, let him labor earnestly to be adorned according to his firstborn word, Logos, the eldest of his angels, as the great archangel of many names, and that could have been Jesus right there, for he is called the authority and the name of God and the word and the man according to God's image and he who sees Israel. For which reason I was induced a little while ago to praise the principles of those who said, We are all one man's sons. Even if we are not yet suitable to be called the sons of God, still we may be deserved to be called the children of this eternal image, of his most sacred word, for the image of God is his most ancient word, or logos. Now, once again, we, that's his second source out of the three he gives. There's no angel named Jesus. There's an angel. There's a firstborn of God. There is a celestial image. But nobody's denying that Philo's theology is being heavily drawn from. In fact, Philo's not even the one who came up with this stuff. This goes back from the beginning when the Septuagint was translated. Aristobulus of Alexandria has ideas similar to this. These are ideas of Platonic, Hellenized Judaism. But the first thing he says with, in bold letters right here is actually named Jesus. All right, let's see what the third source says. On Dreams 1 to 1 5. For there are, as it seems, two temples belonging to God. One being this world in which the high priest is the divine word, his own firstborn son. The other is the rational soul the priest of which is the real true man, the copy of whom, perceptible to the senses, is he who performs his paternal vows and sacrifices, to whom it is enjoined to put on the aforesaid tunic, the representation of the universal heaven, 
in order that the world may join with the man in offering sacrifice, and that man may likewise cooperate with the universe. Now we're getting to what Carrier's getting at with this high priest thing. But that's just not what Philo says. He's saying that Philo says the actual name of this angel is Jesus. But Carrier's being sneaky, borderline dishonest here. Because what actually what Carrier is actually saying is the angel that he's referring to, who's called the East, firstborn celestial image of God, is actually the same name as the high priest who's in Zechariah. Where would we get Zechariah from? Well, if we go back to Confusion of Tongues 62 to 63, the first source he gave, Philo's quoting from Zechariah. Behold, a man who is the East. But he's being sneaky here. Because, yes, if we go to the Septuagint, which would be the version that Philo was using, we do have a high priest whose name is Jesus, or Joshua. And he is even called an anointed one. But, that's to ignore the whole entire book of Zechariah and the meaning of it. See, the two key words here are the east and mountain. And these two key words, east and mountain, is what's going to refute Carrier's theory. See, if you don't understand Zechariah, this is going to sound like a perfect theory. But if you have you read Zechariah, this makes absolutely no sense. And it's complete, utter bullshit. And the reason why is because the man who is called the East is not the high priest. It's the governor who's going to build a second temple, Zerubbabel. And the text that actually what it says is, and thou shalt say to him, thus say the Lord Almighty, behold the man whose name is the East, and he shall spring up from this stem and build the house of the Lord. Now, some people translate this as branch. So what Carrier has done and other mythicists have done is they said, oh, look, the word branch in Hebrew is Netzar. But the Hebrew version of Zechariah doesn't use the word Netzar. It uses the word Zima. So that falls apart too. The whole Nazarene thing, using coming from the term Netzar, being a title of Davidic line, Nazorian, it's completely made up, baseless, doesn't exist in any of the sources. Tons of mythicists who don't think Nazareth even exists. And all you have to do is go to Pliny the Elder, who's writing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, who literally mentions Nazareth, and he even tells you where it is, and it lines up exactly where the Bible says it is. He says the Tetrarch of the Nazarenes is in Col Syria, extra biblical source for Nazareth, meaning the whole branch thing is just complete nonsense. Now, to be fair to Carrier, Jesus, son of Jehoshadak, he is an anointed one. If you actually read Zechariah and Haggai, and we know Philo knows about Haggai because he mentions it multiple times throughout his works. Zechariah and Haggai, the two prophets during the time of the second temple building, mention that there are two anointed ones. And one of them is a plain and the other one is a mountain. Zerubbabel is the mountain. And it says, Joshua, you are but a plain to the mountain Zerubbabel. Meaning Zerubbabel will have a rough, tougher time compared to the easy laid back time of the high priesthood. Zerubbabel, whose name literally means seated in Babylon, is coming from Babylon, coming from the east. Now, this is important because what Philo is talking about is not Joshua the high priest. He's talking about the prophecy from the book of Numbers, in particular, 23.7 and 24 17 and that's why he says i also have heard one of the companions of moses uttered such a speech as this behold a man who is the east the real source of this quote is from numbers 23 7 and here's what it says and balaam lifted up an oracle saying balak brought me from aram the king of moab from the mountains of the east this is such an important part right here. Mountains of the East. And Numbers 24, 17 says, I see him, but now I behold him, but not near. A star will come forth from Jacob, 
a scepter will arise from Israel. He will crush the Moab and strike down the sons of Sheth. This is originally where the star of the east comes from. Now that's not to say that Christians use this for their theology of Jesus. But you can't say this is what Philo meant. The last verse of Haggai says, On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant. I will set you as a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. And by the way, this angel is not Jesus or Zerubbabel, who Philo is even talking about. The incorporeal being that Philo is talking about is the angel that's speaking to Zechariah about Zerubbabel and Joshua. He doesn't even have a name. He's just the divine image of the Lord of hosts. And in Carrier's own source says he has many names. I've already demonstrated it for you. He had plenty of opportunity to specify if that name was Jesus, and he doesn't. This is why you get the logos. He's the mouthpiece, like Hermes. Like Hermes is to Zeus, this angel, who's the word, is the messenger of Yahweh. And every time somebody in the, in the Old Testament is speaking to one of these angels, they're talking to the word of Yahweh. I think this is pretty clear at this point. Joshua's not the king. Zerubbabel is the governor, and he's also of the D Davidic line, which is another slam dunk against Carrier. In the genealogy of Jesus is the whole Davidic line. Zerubbabel is actually in that genealogy. Joshua isn't. Joshua is of the line of Aaron. So it doesn't make sense that he would be the branch. The, the branch would have to be Zerubbabel. In the book called On the Change of Names, Chapter 21, he talks about the name Joshua, as he does talk about other names as well. He says about the name Joshua, Mo Moses changes the name of Hosea into that of Joshua, displaying by his new name distinctive qualities of his character. For the name Hosea is interpreted, what sort of person is this? But Joshua means salvation of the Lord, being the name of the most excellent possible character for the habits are better with respect to those persons who are of such qualities from being influenced by them. It would make a lot more sense right here for Philo just to say, Jesus, Joshua, the name of the Logos, the name of the angel of Yahweh, who is inheriting the kingdom of heaven. But he doesn't say that. He just talks about a name of a person and what the name means. That would have been the perfect time for Philo to specify who the name of this angel is, but he doesn't say that. We're only left to conclude that this is not the name of the angel. So not only is there not literally an angel named Jesus in Philo, like Carrier says, but even if you follow along his crazy reasoning of why he said that, even that falls apart. So there's no Jesus in Philo and there's no pre-existing Jesus angel that predates Christianity. It doesn't exist. I consider this a blatant lie. Now for somebody who has a quote that says any idea that has to be defended with outright lies is almost certainly false. It's kind of ironic after what we just figured out, don't you think? I mean, John's first thing off the bat for the three reasons why he's a mythicist so today I want to tell you three reasons why I'm a mythicist being named Jesus. Named Jesus. Number one reason off the bat is because of this angel named Jesus in Philo. Now, if a Christian found out that Jesus didn't exist, would they still be a Christian? On the flip side of that, John or Joel finding out that this Jesus angel didn't exist. Are you still a mythicist? probably are and listen i'll just level with you right now is mythicism possible absolutely it is i think it's a plausible position to have the evidence is terrible there's no physical evidence there's no first-hand accounts and we only know for certain a few minor things and so i'm going with what's the most likely thing 
I'm going with what the experts tell me. And that is that there probably was a guy who got crucified. Now, the last thing he says about this particular topic is he goes into another blatant lie. I was going to say misleading um, misinformation, but this is actually a blatant lie. He's choosing a certain passage in Zechariah that appears to look favorable for his hypothesis. But with all the things I just told you about Zechariah and Haggai, it doesn't make sense anymore. You'll see why. Because in his book, he tries to say the translation of the Septuagint reads, You shall make crowns and set them upon the head of Jesus, the son of Jehovah, the righteous, the high priest, and say to him, Thus the Almighty Lord, behold the man whose name is Rising, and he shall rise up from his place below, and shall build the house of the Lord, and receive power, and sit and rule upon the throne. That's not what the Septuagint actually says. He mistranslated the last name, the family name of Joshua in this passage, Yehazadek, and he broke it up into son of Jehovah the righteous to make it seem like this is like a son of God thing. He also doesn't tell you that the real meaning of this patch is about two crowns, a silver crown going to Joshua and a gold crown going to Zerubbabel. And here's the, here's the kicker, because after this it says, from his place below, he shall build the house of the Lord and receive power and sit and rule upon the throne. That's Zerubbabel who's going to rule and govern. Joshua is supposed to anoint the king. That's the entire purpose of this ceremony. This is a coronation ceremony where the high priest who has the silver crown anoints the king, who in this case is the Davidic line, from the east. Now, am I, why, where am I getting this from? Why, am I just making this up to try to rebuke Carrier? No, Philo tells you this because one paragraph later, he gives you the context. He tells you about Balaam's prophecy, which I just showed you was about the mountain in the east. All the context is there, but what Carrier does is he takes the context away and then he hones in on mistranslations and then fools you. In a commentary from the New American Standard, it actually says the original text must have had the name of Zerubbabel here, not that of Joshua. Joshua is a different man from the one called the shoot. And in it is upon the shoot that the crown is to be placed. And I get why they're, and the re, and the, they're not just saying that for no reason. This, in the context of what Haggai is saying and what Zechariah is saying, and in the context of what Philo is also saying, when he talks about in the next paragraph, the prophecy from Balaam about the mountain in the east, Zerubbabel is called the mountain. He is from the Davidic line. He is the governor. He is the one building the temple. But there is two crowns, and the high priest does anoint the king. So it's actually kind of in the middle. There's two anointed ones, the high priest and the king. And this actually becomes the playbook of Carrier. Take context away from things, and instead of, instead of trying to figure out or teach you what the truth is, he's trying to argue for mythicism. That's all this. It's all he is. He's the polar opposite of what a Christian is. Christian fundamentalists. They don't care what the truth is. They don't care what the actual facts are. They're not trying to actually learn about stuff. They're just arguing for Christianity. This is what myth this is what mythicism does. It doesn't matter what the truth is, it doesn't matter what the facts are. They just is there any way we can twist this stuff to make it look like mythicism is true? And find all the outs possible. Once more, we interrupt your regularly scheduled program. This is the Joker speaking from his secret hideout. <laughs> I have an amusing message for the directors of the Gotham Steamship Lines. Now the evidence, you go in and look at the evidence and you can confirm that this is what Mark is doing because you go through it. To bring me to my next point, the evidence. Show me evidence that God doesn't exist. That's a dumb question because I can't show evidence that there's not a flying hippopotamus above my house right now. 
some people think this applies to the question of Jesus exists or not. If Jesus didn't exist, where's the evidence? How do you show evidence of something that didn't exist? But it actually doesn't apply here. Because there could be evidence, if Jesus didn't exist, there should be hostile witnesses early on contesting his existence. Not even from hostile witnesses, from the true believers from the beginning who knew this was all celestial. Where's their rebuttals to Mark? Where is their documents? Where is their writings besides Paul? They don't exist. And you can't claim that the church deleted all this stuff because the church recorded all the heresies in like hundreds of books. We have Hippolytus. We have Irenaeus, Justin Martyr. And we have all of these fragments that we found in Egypt. They recorded docetism. They recorded all the heresies. And if this was the case, this heresy would sure as hell be around. And it's not. In fact, when we do look at the hostile witnesses, they all agree that this was actual historical events. Middle of the second century, we have Celsus, who thinks that Jesus had a father named Pantera. He says his sources are from the Jews. He's getting from Jewish sources. And that evidence actually checks out. See, Dr. James Tabor and Peter Schaefer, who do a lot of work on the Talmud, have pointed out that the sources in the Talmud are early, some of them first century. And mythicists do not like to talk about the Talmud because there's evidence in there for a historical Jesus. So what they do is they, they swat it away by saying, oh, it's a late source and it's unreliable. But there's a lot in there that we can look at that gives us some information. The trial says in Sanhedrin 43a that a crier goes out before the condemned man. This indicates that it is only before him while he is being led to execution. On Passover Eve, they hung the corpse of Jesus the Nazarene after they killed them by way of stoning. And a crier went out before him 40 days, publicly proclaiming Jesus the Nazarene is going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, incited people to idol worship, and led Jew Jewish people astray. Now, some people have pointed out that the dating of this is off because it says under the government of Alexander Janaeus. There's three explanations for this, and they're, none of them are that this is a different Jesus, like Carrier will try to tell you. The odds, and Carrier is an odds guy, so he knows this. The odds of there being two Jesus of Nazareth who were hung on Passover Eve for leading Israel astray, whose mother was named Mary, 0% that there's two of those. Didn't happen. So we have to look at why they have that extra information there. It's like, you don't say if a murder happened, the body, the person's dead. We know the murder happened. But our witness comes comes up and says it happened last week. But we know it didn't happen last week. We know it happened last night. That doesn't mean the murder didn't happen. You don't just stop investigating. So there's three explanations for this. One of them is Alexander Janaeus is the one who set up the Sanhedrin. He's the one who passed down the government from the Maccabees into the next dynasty, the Roman Empire, the later to soon to be Herodian dynasty, uh, Antipater, basically. And so you can argue that they're talking about the government, Sanhedrin, that was set up by Alexander Janaeus. That's one explanation. Another explanation is they just got it wrong. The scribe just got it wrong. Just wrote the wrong thing in there. Plausible. And the third explanation, this is from some scholars that think the persecution was so bad in the Roman Empire that they had to sort of mask their text. And instead of saying that they're, because they're talking, talking shit about Jesus in here, and to sort of avoid being persecuted for that, they'll just say it's a different Jesus. That's plausible too. But by no, by no chance is it a different Jesus of Nazareth. But this is not the only source in there about him. See, it talks about a man named Jacob from Kafar Sama, who's in Sepphoris, right next to Nazareth. Checks out. And it says the name of Jesus Ben Pantera. And he was healing in his name. And it worked. So hostile witnesses giving him credit for someone working. But then 
after that person was survived from the snake bite that he was healed from, ended up dying anyway. So it's a kind of weird story. And that's from the Jerusalem Talmud Shabbat 114. And the last one is that there is a king and I was killing the sages, Yohashua ben Paraya and Jesus, his student, who went to Alexandria, Egypt, when there was peace between King and I and the sages. Simon ben Yashata sent a message to Yehosha ben Parai, for me, Jerusalem, the holy city, to you, Alexander of Egypt. Some people are sensing that Jesus was the student here. Up for debate. But either way, when we look at Celsus, when we look at the Jewish historians, when we look at other sources that are more hostile to Christianity, none of them are contesting the existence of Jesus. Even if just one person did, that would be something to look at. But we don't have anything like that. We don't have any sources from these celestial Christians. We don't have anything from them. They're just not, just doesn't exist. The evidence is zilch, zero. Now, as you can see here, Element 48, Carrier talks about the rank Raglan mythotype ranking scale. And as you can see, down on this list, you see the A and O of my own pen. And this is me calculating Alexander the Great and Caesar Augustus, who Carrier claims don't make the list. Now, just to tell you what this list is, Carrier claims that Jesus is on a list of mythotypes that other dying and rising gods and saviors also rank high on. And he claims that there's no other actual human being that lived that's on this list. The only people he say that's on this list are Oedipus, Moses, Jesus, Theseus, Dionysus, Romulus, Perseus, Hercules, Zeus, Bellerophon, J Jason, Osiris, Pelops, Asclepius, and Joseph, son of Jacob. Now that's a good point. If it was true, if it was true that Jesus is the only person on this list and it's just a list of myths, that would be a really good case for mythicism. But it's demonstrably false. And there's over 50 people in history who actually make this list. Number one, Francis Lee Utley has Abraham Lincoln through folklore biography scoring all 22 points on Raglan's archetype exactly. And this is all within 40 years of his life, just like Jesus. King Ahab, king of Israel, based on the biblical text. Ahab's mother, royal virgin, says it right in Isaiah, wife of Omri. His father was King Omri. Israel was considered the child of God, as were well as the kings and rulers. No details of his childhood. He defeated King Hadadzar. He marries Jezebel, princess of Tyre. He became king. For a, for a time, he reigns uneventfully. He has all 22 of the, of the list ranked. Alexander the Great, one of the ones I did myself, personally, from the Alexander Romance, easily scores 14 at least. Apollonius Satiana, virtually every scholar, save Robert Price, obviously, would acknowledge that Apollonius Satiana existed as a historical figure. The circumstances of his birth are strange, reputed to be the son of Zeus, returned to Tiana after his, his kingdom, reigned uneventfully for a time, prescribed laws, teachings, and the Pythagorean tradition. Attilia the Hun. Legendary development is seen to be immense, particular in the works of Germanic legend of the medieval era. Father was a chieftain of the Huns. He returns to the future kingdom. He is the victor over his brothers and rulers of the Huns. Now, I, obviously, I can't read all this because I'd be here for four hours. But I'm going to scroll past so that you can check every one of these. And you can look it up yourself. Billy the Kid. Chaitanya, 13. Caligula, all 22. Claudius, all 22. Cleopatra. Confucius, David Koresh, Donald Trump. Let's check this one out. Donald Trump, the descendant of Hakan V, according to him himself, king of Norway. The circumstances of his conception are unusual, as he is said to be the second coming of Christ, according to 
some Christians. As the second Christ, he is the Son of God. And reaching manhood, he does go to his further kingdom, his future kingdom, the USA. He is hailed as king by some figures. For a time, he reigned without wars, natural catastrophes. He prescribes laws. He lost favor with his subjects, even with the GOP. He was driven from his home in New York City. <laughs> this is a good one. Now, there's some of these I, I might even argue against. I might not dogmatically just accept this just to be in spite of carrier. But I just want you to look at these because there's a lot of good points here. Elvis Presley, General Custer, Genghis Khan, George Washington. All the sources are listed here too. Haley Selassie, Henry V, Henry VI, Juan of Key, Joan of Arc, JFK, Julius Caesar, Lady Bowsey, Lloyd Rael, Mithridates IV of Pontus. And this was a big one too that I had in my own notes. Because he has a star that signifies his birth and everything. Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia. Pythagoras. Sargon of Akkad. Shaka, King of Zulu. Siegfried Sigurd. Theodoric the Great. Remember, you can always pause this and take a look at it. Tiberius Caesar, number 37. Vasilevsky. Wen of Jin. William Wallace. Zedekiah. Napoleon. Let's, see, here, let's check this one out. Napoleon said was born low noble minor royalty woman and his family was further descended from king charlemagne was his conception mysterious consider that napoleon was in fact divinized he was also anointed by the pope by the way he is portrayed as the sun deity in this artwork he is referred to as a son of heaven others compared him to the god prometheus the son of the titan iapetus indeed the deification of this hero is ubiquitous truly he was the son of a god, but not only was he div divinized, he was also thought to be his prophecy, the Messiah, by some. And this is a fact. You can go look into the uh, the experts that write histories on Napoleon. The anointing ceremony of Napoleon was such a big deal. It was such a turning point in history. The Pope had to be ridiculed for this. They have images of the Pope on his back, and Napoleon has Caligula and Nero. The two beasts from Revelation, basically, standing there. And so this was a turning point in history. Here you have Napoleon being anointed. Carrier argues that Paul actually was a mythicist, Christian. Meaning that Paul thought there was no Jesus on earth. Carrier argues that there's strange and ambiguous language in the Greek. Which, when I've showed this to people at I talk to people I have on as guests and ask them these questions. Is this Greek ambiguous? Is this strange? They don't really agree on that. Let's go through some of these examples of the Greek, Paul. What did Paul really think? What does the data actually say? Now let's go through some of these strange and ambiguous verses and interpret what they actually mean in different ways. Galatians 4.4 4 says, Begotten of a woman, begotten under the law, now, literally, which most people agree with, means born from Mary. Allegorically, descended from Hagar. Figuratively, woman born took human form. Came into being from the seed of David according to the flesh. Romans 1.3 Now, this could only mean that he's descended from David, an earthly lineage. The carrier argues that it came into being from David's sperm miraculously in the heavens even though there's no evidence for that there's no accounts of this there's no texts that talk about this it's just kind of a speculation then you have i saw james the brother of the lord galatians 1 9 it's pretty straightforward he's the blood brother of jesus in fact josephus even mentions this in the late middle 90s a few decades down the road so we have, you know, multiple sources agreeing on this. And the way they get around it is by saying Josephus actually meant something else. I want you to hold that thought. Just put that on the back burner. This is going to be a regular occurrence. Whenever there's a text that mythicists don't like, the author probably meant something else. It's never straightforward. The author meant something else. It's ambiguous. It's strange. Another one. Rulers of this age. Crucified of the Lord of glory earthly rulers crucified of jesus 
Rulers, the word in Greek is archon. There was an archon of Athens, famous, a famous king of Athens was called the archon. It's all over Plutarch. It's all over Plato. It's all over the ancient writers, Xenophon, name it, Herodotus. Archon is just a word. I mean, it'd, it'd be like saying, since Pluto is the king of Hades, Basilio of Hades, does that Basilio word mean just the mythical king? No, the word just means king. It just stays that way. Whether you're talking about a demon or an angel or a real king, that's what the Archon means. The next one is in the night which he was handed over. This is a big one. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Who handed him over? Judas handed them over. But they'll argue that God handed over Jesus or someone else handed over Jesus in the heavens. But then why doesn't it just say that then? It's Occam's razor with this one. Why doesn't it just say he was handed over by the archons in the third heaven? It just says he was handed over. And this just makes sense that he was handed over on the night of the Passover, which is the night he was executed. According to multiple sources, extra biblical and biblical, Jewish sources, Talmud sources, he took, broke bread, took the cup and said, now it's just 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 26. He either instituted a Eucharist at the Last Supper, which was 99% of the experts say, or Carrier will say, he instituted the Eucharist through visions. If you don't want Jesus to exist, and you want it to be that this was all through visions, then that would make sense to you. But if you're actually like seriously sitting there wondering which makes the most sense, you're probably going with the first one. He was handed over, Paul says. That Lord Jesus, on the night when he was handed over, took a loaf of bread, and when gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink, the cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes who is he talking to is he talking to his angel buddies if that was really the case the argument that this is paul's vision is just way too much paul's getting a vision to stop persecuting christians that's paul's vision paul's not getting visions of the past things that jesus was doing in heaven there's no indication of that this is a story that Paul knows. This is a historical event. Paul knows James and Peter, and he knows the story. This is probably relating to some sort of text, like a, some sort of Q document, maybe, or even just a verbal communication. This is a story of an actual historical event. And I'm sorry, but if this was actually all happening in the stars, you should have some signifier for that. There should be something in this text that lets us know that. But it doesn't. It's on the night he was handed over. Now, Carrier then says that Paul never uses the word of human birth, despite it hundreds of times typically being, typically to mean being or becoming. Rather, his preferred word for being born is gnao. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Paul says Adam was made using the same word as he uses for Jesus. Yet this is obviously not a reference to being born, but to being constructed directly by God. If so, for Adam, then so it could be for Jesus, whom Paul equated with Adam in that same verse. But this is actually false. Because if we go to Genesis 2, 7, Septuagint, says God formed man dust from the earth and breathed into his face a breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the word eplasen is the word for formed Adam. If the carrier was correct, we should see just this word using for Jesus as well. Instead of being born from a woman according to the flesh, it should, it should say a plus formed from God, but it doesn't. And now let's get to the second part. Again, it's all 
because this is the only most standard common word for become or birth in the ancient Greek world. Here are the examples of this word being used for just regular human births. In fact, the root word for geno, generate, give birth, create. It has so many different ways to use it. There's so many different variations of this word that it's going to show up by itself in different forms. Paul, if he really was a Jewish man, probably has a variation of this word that might have some influence on where area or the part of the world he is. But the word is so diverse and it's used so often just for regular births or for something to come into being that you can't just say that because it's by itself in certain areas that it has to mean something other than what it really means. Born of a woman, which he says is never used in any of these contexts and is a very strange word, appears to be an idiomatic Hebraism, simply meaning that Jesus was a human being. Mythicists will try to argue that this is such a strange thing. Why would they say born of a woman? What does it mean? Nobody says they're born of a woman. It's just implied. But this is demonstrably false because this is used in Job 14.1, 15.4, and 25.4. The same word here, born of a woman, born of a woman, and born of a woman. The Dead Sea Scrolls community rules uses the same language as what shall one born of a woman be considered in your presence? This is a Hebrew idiom for human beings only. It's actually like a slam dunk on mythicism because it even says in the bottom, what is the spirit of flesh? And this is the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is first century Jews. This is right up the Christian world. And I want to point out that the word sarx, flesh, is a key Pauline theological term referring essentially to human existence with emphasis on transitory, weak, frail nature of that existence, according to the flesh, 21 times by Paul denotes being or living according to merely human, which is where we see Romans 9, 5, as the flesh is concerned. The Messiah, which Paul is talking about, only in respect to the relationship, which is strictly narrowly human. Which brings me to another point is, the Messiah was always supposed to be human. This is why Philo never talks about the angel being the Messiah. The Messiah is strictly human. Nobody would be called Messiah unless they were human to begin with. This is why you have groups like the Ebionites who are wiped out before the end of the first century, who are written about in the heresiologist as the closest people to Jerusalem who are Christians, Hebrew speaking Christians who only thought that Jesus was a man and nothing more. If Carrier was correct, you would see none of this. The Ebionites would all be mythicists, and Philo would already have a Messiah angel. Paul always differentiates the Lord Jesus to the God the Father. There's a complete difference in Paul's letters. And this is why you see the opposite of what Carrier is arguing. You see the opposite of euhemerization. But the euhemerization. You start off with a God, usually for hundreds of years, and then they sort of get like pinned into history. With this case, you look at Mark, the first gospel, it's sort of coming off of what we see in Paul. Now, Paul's logos is pre-existence, but Jesus as a human is just a man. And we see this in other early Christian theologies, such as the Carpocratians and Valentinians, where Jesus had to attain a level of apotheosis to become the Logos, to become the divine intellect of God that was always eternal. And so Mark starts off with just the man. 
And as you go through Luke and Matthew, he gets more and more divine. By the time he gets the latest gospel, he's completely God. He's one with God. And Paul's theology is not lined up word for word with Philo's. John's is. So the Christians, by the time John gets written, are using Philo's theology to build their theology. And they're building off what Paul started. But Paul is in no way the same as Philo. He's it's not to say that he's not close. Of course, that's the case. But he's like that in Mark, too. And that is a progression over time. The Messiah was a chosen human anointed by God. Christianity took it to another level as time went on. And you can see in Paul, he always separates Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, from Theos, God. He doesn't actually call Jesus Theos, God. Paul says in Galatians that his gospel is not from human origin. And he's only saying that because he did not meet Jesus like Kephas and James did. He got his from a revelation. And so he's saying his gospel is not like their gospel that's human in origin. His is from the divine revelation. Because then you see in Galatians 1, 18, 24, he tells you this. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Kephas and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see another of the apostles except James, the brother of the Lord. He talks about the promises were spoken to Abraham and his descendant. Scripture does not say, and to descendants, referring to many, but to one and to your descendant, who is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law that came 430 years later does not cancel a covenant previously ratified by God so as to invalidate the promise for if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise, but God graciously gave it to Abraham through the promise. It was not added because of transgressions until the arrival of the descendant. Who is the descendant? Abraham, David, Jesus. And Paul cannot be any more clear here in Romans 1.15 has came from the seed of David according to the flesh, who has appointed to be son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness from the resurrection of the dead. That is just the clearest you're going to get. Unless you want this to be ambiguous, unless you don't want this to be clear, you can make it, tell yourself, make it sound however you want to sound. But the rest of us in the normal world understand this, what this means. You're going to get him drunk? <laughs> yeah, Queenie, you know what to do with this now. And the last thing I want to talk about is extra biblical sources. Because mythicists are correct about myth extra biblical sources. They're very bad. In fact, most of the extra biblical sources that Christians like to point to are in the second century. Pliny the Younger is in the late 110s. Tacitus, Suetonius are in the 120s. And so those sources, and even in those sources, they barely know who Jesus is. Pliny the Elder, Philo, these guys are around in Israel during the time of Jesus' life. And they're talking about subjects central to Christianity. They don't mention Jesus. Mythicists have a good point with this one. Jesus didn't write anything down. But neither did Socrates, Diogenes, Thales. There's a lot of ancient great people, very famous, who had a lot of followers and disciples, who just didn't write anything down. It's not uncommon. It's not a bad point. But it's not like the end all be all. So the first extra biblical source that we get is Josephus. But this is an important source because it's something different than what Paul is laying down. And you can see that the Gospels after Josephus, so Acts basically, 
and John maybe are using Josephus. Josephus is giving you information that's not necessarily in Mark and Luke and Matthew. So it's different. It's not dependent on the Gospels, but it could be dependent on word of mouth through people who know the Gospels and know Paul. So Christians are already around at this time, so it's not like a primary source, basically. So with that being said, Christian mythicists still want to deny that Josephus wrote about Jesus. Why? I don't really know. They just want to. Because they have a point about one thing. The first passage about Jesus in Josephus in book 18 is completely fudged, doctored, and interpolated to a high degree. Borderline forgery. But there's a reason why scholars know that it's, there's something of kernel of truth there. And there's two things that I refute from mythicists. Mythicists will claim that this passage has no belonging in this chapter. But that's false. Because book 18 starts off about Pontius Pilate and the calamities that happened under the Jews during his time. Jesus died by Pontius Pilate. So of course he would be in that section. He actually fits perfectly in there. And the paragraph after the story about Jesus starts off with, and also at this time, the, the first event that actually happens in this book is this a story about Jesus. So there wouldn't be a, and after this, it would just start off that way. So the language is indicating that something is there. But the biggest reason of all is that he's also mentioned again in book 20. In book 20, he talks about the brother, James, who was stoned by the Sanhedrin who is the brother of the Christ and this this story cannot be interpolated because it's so central to the chapter in the book that if you take it out nothing makes sense anymore so instead of claiming this is an interpolation carrier just plays a bunch of speculative games and says what they meant to say was this is Jesus ben Damnius and so Jesus ben Damnius is a character who comes a paragraph later who gets the high priesthood and this is where scholars are calling him out as just making shit up because this does not fit and here's the reason why this the the sadducees are in control of the priesthood especially if you know josephus the high priesthood only goes to a handful of people that are alive there are people in waiting who are who are looking at that high priesthood probably more than we look at the president right now. So it's not just going to some random guy they feel bad for. It's going to somebody who's ordained, who's in the Levites, who's in the temple, who's already knows the situation. And the brother of James is not the guy. James is not in that family. And if he was in that family, if he was in that network, Josephus would have just said it. At the end of the chapter, Josephus easily could have said, and this is what we're paid for the death of James. But he doesn't say that. So it just doesn't make sense. Logically, does it make sense? It only makes sense if you want the Christ to be taken out of the story. If you don't want Jesus to be in the story, this, this story makes perfect sense. And of course, you're going to go with it. In fact, look at the response from Dennis McDonald when he hears this. And keep in mind, Dennis McDonald is not an apologist who is sucking up to the church. This is a guy who's been on Pine Creek's channel. He doesn't give a shit about the church. Now, we actually know that uh, certain scribal practices, it is entirely possible that originally this passage said, uh, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, Ben Damnius, if there was an interlinear note above it that said the one called Christ, scribes might have thought that that was they were supposed to be transposed. One was an error and the other was a correction. So their concern was not that Ananus killed these people. Their concern was that he procedurally assembled a Sanhedrin without consent. Uh, so they actually don't really care about James and this other guy. Like the, the, the people who are interfering here think Ananus just assembled a court and prosecuted some people uh, unlawfully. I can't so tell you how much I disagree with that reading. Okay. <laughs> my I mean, it's my what it says. And even if you no, look at the Greek, no, I don't no, think no, it no, changes no. much. Why is it that Josephus goes out of his way to contrast the view of the law 
by Sadducees and Ananus, and the view of the law of some in the city who are more accurate with respect to the law and more tolerant. They're, they're, yes, they're going to use the uh, illegal um, meeting of the Sanhedrin uh, as the excuse for getting rid of him. It's a procedural thing. But Josephus is making a Jew, uh, and by the way, he uses very unusual vocabulary for this. He's quite clear about what he's trying to accomplish. You're right, by the way, it's not the changing of the law, it's the violation of the law, paranomasesis, something like that. Yeah. And then, but the word that's used for cruel is um, omi, which is very unusual and harsh. So I think the primary conflict is between the, the Sadducees who are harsh and those in the city who are generous. Now, I do think that you're right, that they've objected to an illegal calling of the Sanhedrin. Um, so here, I think we have two motivations, one having to do with a different understanding of law. So it means in my reading that James and these others have a, an interpretation of law, which for people who are generous is tolerable. And those of whom are sticklers and especially are protective of the temple. And finally, with that being said, the reason why we know this exists is because Origen, when he's writing about Josephus, he doesn't really know about the passage that we all agree on is that it's interpolated, but he does mention James, which means he knows about that passage. And so what Carrier does is he's completely sneaky about this. And instead of just admitting that this verse probably exists, he tries to say that Origen got his sources wrong. And really he meant Hegesippus. Here's the actual verse. Although not believing in Jesus the Christ and seeking after the cause in the fall of Jerusalem, of the temple whereas he ought to have said that the conspiracy against Jesus was the cause of these calamities befalling the people since they put to death Christ who was a prophet says nevertheless being although against his will not far from the truth that these disasters happen to the Jews as punishment for the death of James the just who was the brother of Jesus called Christ he's dependent on Josephus period so so how does this get peer reviewed? You might be asking. A lot of people actually ask that. <clears throat> well, sure enough, an investigative journalist has looked into the situation. And here's what we have. On the historicity of Jesus was first announced to be accepted as a publisher at July 17, 2013 on Free Thought Blogs, specifically Richard Carrier's blog. This blog of Carrier's is now inactive because Carrier was alleged to have sexual harassment, several people, and Skepticon. Dr. Richard Carrier, that guy who went absolutely bonkers and started suing people for millions of dollars for saying that he's creepy and for not inviting him to their conferences, particularly Amy Frank, the woman who uh, posted on her own Facebook page that uh, Richard Carrier had been creepy to her, that she felt that he had sexually harassed her. Uh, even though writing this to you is scary, in parentheses. Okay, so this time I'm saying fuck it and just burying my heart to you and being a little overly frank and forthcoming and just flat out hitting on you. It has nothing to do with posts like that. You are unequivocally awesome and you know it, which is unequivocally sexy. Leading to him being banished from Skepticon and from Free Thought Blogs. His blog, entitled Richard Carrier Blogs, was moved to another site and the originals were presumed lost but are now available through Internet Archive. As the blog currently stands in its present form, Carrier states, I sought four peer review reports from major professors of New Testament early Christianity and two have returned their reports, approving with revisions, and those revisions have been made. Since two peers for the academic publications, we can still proceed, and Sheffield's own peer reviewers have approved the text. Two others missed the assigned deadline, but I'm still hoping to get their reports and I'll do my best to meet any revisions they require as well. There we have it. Carrier's book was peer reviewed by both peer reviewers he got, and then also reviewers at Sheffield Phoenix Press, 
One may be inclined to have the story end here, but it does not, because a few things are rather peculiar about this peer review process that Carrier is describing here. First, Carrier says, I sought four peer review reports from major professors of New Testament early Christianity, and two have returned their reports, approving it with revisions, and those revisions have been made. Curious. So Carrier chose his reviewers. That is not how standard practice. Carrier even notes in a comment below that it is standard to provide the publisher with a list of names, which may or may not be accepted. It is not standard practice to obtain the reviewers oneself. He writes, an academic press will often ask you, as standard procedure, whom you think will be the best suited to peer review your submission. They will ask for as many names as possible because being unpaid, most will ask to decline. They might not go with the names you recommend, but they will consider them. So the process that this book went through is already odd. Of course, maybe he suggested these names before he got the reviews, but then he outright says in the comments that this happened before he even got the publisher. Carrier writes the same comment. My own effort to line up formal peer reviewers, which I started before I got a publisher in order to speed up the pipeline of publication, was to find peers who held diverse opinions of the thesis, but whose work in a field is exemplary and whose judgment I highly respected and who held... And by the way, when Carrier judges... When Carrier respects someone's judgment, <laughs> it means that he agrees with them. Because he, he trashes everyone else, else who he doesn't agree with. So that's kind of odd. Anyways, and who held rankings professorships in the field. Before reading the manuscript, one was sympathetic to the thesis, one was undecided as to its merits, and two others were actively opposed to the thesis, but not irrationally. So Carrier began finding reviewers before he had a publisher, and he had made sure that the four that he got were not irrationally opposed to his thesis. In short, he chose those who would be most sympathetic even if they had opposed him ultimately by his own admission. In fact, in another post, he makes this clear. He chose his reviewers pre-vet his manuscript. It's important to note that this clarification, Sheffield Phoenix selected its own peer reviewers to vet my book, as they do all academic treatises they publish. That's the entire point of an academic press. This was after I also submitted peer review reports from multiple prominent professors of biblical studies I had to pre-vet my manuscript to ensure it would pass any peer review a publisher engaged. So Carrier, by his own admission, did not go through the double-blinded peer review with reviewers, but still, there were Shuffled, Shuffled Phoenix's own peer reviews as well, right? Well, here's where things get really interesting. In Carrier's original announcement on Free Thought Blogs, access via Internet Archive, Carrier wrote, I sought four peer reviewers reports from major professors of New Testament or early Christianity, and two have returned their reports, approving with revisions, and those revisions have been made since two peers in the standard number for the academic publications we can proceed. Two others missed the deadline, but I'm still hoping to get their reports, and I'll do my best to meet revisions they require. And I was, you know, I always wondered why Carrier, if he's such an Ivy League guy, such a Columbia PhD guy who always talks about how he's peer reviewed, he's got a PhD, why didn't he go to Oxford? Why didn't he do what, what Bart Aaron does or David Litwa does? Go to Oxford, get the get the top of the line major league peer review study, and then nobody can talk shit after that. You want to know why he didn't go to Oxford? Because he would never have passed an Oxford peer review. That's not my own words. I've been told that by multiple people. Here's the notable absence of Carrier's original. In the original statement, Carrier never said that he got peer reviewers from Sheffield Phoenix Press. Furthermore, it should be noted that Carrier originally said that Sheffield Phoenix Press was the publishing house of the University of Sheffield, UK. But he later changed this to a publishing house at the University of Sheffield, UK. Instead, when it was pointed out, this statement was incorrect. So the original post has made a lot of things fishy. 
I did some checking through the Internet Archive, and the Archive has snaps of the blog from the time that it was up until it was finally taken down. In a snapshot made October 20th, 2015, one finds that Richard Carrier had not yet made the alteration. However, January 2016, the post now includes the statement about Sheffield's own peer reviewers. So why is it, for two years, Carrier never included this comment, but then between October and January 2015 and 16, he then alters his post to include this? Well, in 2015, we began di getting discussion on the fact that Carrier never really got a peer-reviewed book, but a PAL-reviewed one. The website Post Flaviana specifically began investigating this and noted this was not typical peer review at all. So what happened? Carrier altered the text of his post in 2016, and later he responded to Post Flaviana and specifically used the quite real interpolation into the text to argue that Post Flaviana ignored what he said when in reality that section did not exist in the earliest version. Carrier replied to their accusations by quoting this altered text. I sought four peer review reports from major professors of the New Testament or early Christianity and two have returned their reports approving with revisions and those revisions have been made since two peer reviews is the standard number for the academic publications we can proceed and Sheffield's own peer reviewers have approved the text. Two others missed the assigned deadline, but I'm still hoping to get the reports, and I'll do my best to meet any revisions they require as well. Now, why would anyone have to edit this post? Why would you ever edit a post about your peer review? Why don't you just put a new one up or something? Why would you go back to the old one and edit it? That is very... I'm not, I'm not going to lie. This is based off an, a private uh, investigation... This is not like I can prove this, but he's got a point here. This is some weird shit going on. Some weird shit going on. And so he tried to email Sheffield and got this response. Can you briefly describe the peer review process that Richard Carrier on the history of Jesus went through? Was the peer review process part of the decision to whether to publish and got this reply? We can assure anyone who asks that all our books are peer reviewed before being accepted, but we cannot undertake the process to describe the process just to any person who asks us to do so. You know, another uh, person doing some work as well was in a chat. This is what they told me. So this is all allegedly. And I and Carrier should come forth and clear this up maybe. Allegedly, someone at Sheffield told them that this is the most scrutinized published book they have ever had in their entire history. It's their biggest stain on their credibility so far and it's the biggest embarrassment Sheffield Phoenix has ever had so if that's wrong I would love for somebody to clarify that <laughs> and now people of Gotham City the moment you have all been waiting for <laughs> the grand finale the climax of my performance the zenith of my career the unmasking of Batman and Robin, the boy wonder. <laughs> Could this mean curtains? As the clown prince of crime, I decline. 